So um, I'm really happy to welcome everyone to this uh, continuation of our Thursday evening series um, on in the racial justice journey. Uh, this fall, all of our events are devoted to history and tonight once again, uh, and in a very special way this time, we are going to hear uh, about the history of our very own Lincoln uh, as it relates to the relations between African Americans and people of European descent uh, in the 18th century. I just want to say, uh, in addition to thanking uh, Don Hafner for accepting our invitation, uh, I want to thank the Lincoln Historical Society for partnering with First Parish in Lincoln to sponsor this event. Uh, we're very pleased this evening to have as representatives of both uh, organizations, um, the Reverend Jenny Rankin and Sarah Mattis representing the Lincoln Historical Society. Gus Brown is going to introduce Don Hafner. You won't hear from me until Q and A. Uh, and when, uh, so we're imagining the following structure. Uh, Gus will uh, introduce Don, and then uh, he will speak for half an hour, little more than half an hour, perhaps as he wishes, no fixed limit. Then we'll have as much Q and A as we like uh, until about quarter of nine at which point we have asked Sarah Mattis and Jenny Rankin to offer some closing thoughts uh, in response to the picture that Don is going to present to us of the history of our uh, town and region. So that is uh, what you can expect. Um, and we will again need some help with the Q&A so you can put questions in the chat, you can raise your hand. Joan Kimball and I um, and Ben, I'm sure will be helping us look out for people who have questions. We'll do our very best uh, to get everyone um, who has a question, the opportunity to ask it of Don or to contribute to the conversation. But we thank you all for being here, and I'm going to pass the baton, as it were, to Gus, who's going to tell us a little bit about Don. Okay, thank you, Mary. It's, it's my genuine pleasure this evening to introduce formally our speaker, Don Hafner. Don is a retired professor of political science at Boston College, where he taught courses in international politics, American foreign policy, and national security and arms control policy. Don has also served as associate director of BC's Center for Human Rights and International Justice. And when he retired from BC in 2014, Dean was vice provost for undergraduate academic affairs. Don grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and his undergraduate degree is from Kalamazoo College. He earned his PhD at the University of Chicago. And while a young professor still, Don served as, as an advisor with the United States delegation in Geneva negotiating limits with the Soviet Union on strategic nuclear weapons. So Don's connections to Lincoln are many and longstanding, having joined the Lincoln Minutemen in 1986, serving twice as, as their captain. Don is also a very active and greatly appreciated board member of the Lincoln Historical Society. Demonstrating his love for Lincoln's history, Don has written many articles for Lincoln publications and he continues to be an active author on things Lincoln. Two of his recent books are a biography of William Smith, captain of the Lincoln Minuteman in 1705, and most recently, Tales of the Battle Road, April 19th, 1775. In addition, Don is a member of the Guild of Historical Interpreters. He is a historian's historian, and he is also one of the nicest people you will ever want to meet. 
Don, we are so glad that you're speaking with us this evening. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Gus, for that uh, very generous introduction. And uh, <clears throat> my apologies to any in the audience who are, in fact, academic historians. I am not. I'm poaching on your field. I'm sorry, but there it is. Um, my thanks uh, to the First Parish for this invitation to share some of Lincoln's history this evening. In the next 25 minutes or so, I'd like to cover three topics and then finish with a question uh, of what we might learn from all of this history for our own times. <clears throat> First of all, what I'd like to do is to sketch the size and the character of the Black community in 18th century Lincoln. This will be the statistical part, if you will. And then secondly, I'd like to explore what it is like, was like to be Black in Lincoln and to do that through stories of Lincoln's Black residents. Uh, Ray Shepard set a very powerful example in his presentation last time of the power of stories of individual lives and telling us something about what it was like to be at that time. Uh, but I also have to note, as Reverend Jenny Rankin uh, remarked in her sermon last Sunday, uh, this is not easy history. Uh, these are not necessarily happy stories, but I think they are very illuminating stories. And then third, I'd like to consider the role uh, played by Lincoln's first church in the lives of the town's Black residents in the 18th century. Um, I'm admittedly going to be moving briskly here, but that will give us a lot more time to explore afterwards the portions of this history which interest you in particular. Uh, let me apologize in advance. Uh, despite all the rain the other day, my autumn allergies sometimes take the best of my voice, so I hope that uh, I will uh, still be understandable even if I begin to get a little raspy. Um, first, a note on terminology that I will be using. In 18th century Massachusetts, the term for African Americans was Negro, and the term for mixed race residents with African heritage was mulatto. <clears throat> Both of those groups were treated essentially the same way socially and legally in the 18th century. And I will use the broader term black to include both groups. So that um, just is background for what you're going to be hearing. So first, let me tackle, what do we know about the size and the character of the black community in 18th century Lincoln? Uh, regrettably, the quick answer is not much. Uh, we often lack even the basic information on births, on marriages, and on deaths of, of the black community. Black residents in the 18th century in Lincoln were either enslaved or they were poor. And neither group was very likely to go to the town clerk and register the important events in their lives, particularly if there was a fee involved in doing so. And let me give you an example of who gets lost precisely because of those limitations. There was a black woman named Combo who was enslaved in the household of the Reverend William Lawrence of Lincoln's first church in the 18th century. Combo was inherited as property by Reverend Lawrence's wife when Reverend Lawrence's wife's parents died. Beyond that, we know virtually nothing of Combo, not her age, not her origins, not her parents, not whether she ever had any children, nothing. Just 20 words in Reverend Lawrence's bold handwriting and a slip of paper that he kept recording Combo's death in 1778. To put it differently, we learn about Combo's life, the totality of it, only when she left it. You can have some understanding of the size of the Black community in Lincoln, however, from a Massachusetts census in 1754, and that was the year that Lincoln was founded, and so that's useful. This was a census of all enslaved Black residents over the age of 16 in Massachusetts. And in that census, Lincoln reported 16 enslaved Black men and seven enslaved Black women. But this census left uncounted any Black residents of Lincoln who were under the age of 16, or any who were free. And as an example of who got missed, not only in this census, but also in the church's history, in May of 1755, Reverend Lawrence noted, and I'm quoting, baptized Bathsheba, surnamed Moulton, adult. Now, this is an interesting entry because the phrase surnamed is rare. Uh, Reverend Lawrence used it only once in his records, but 
those of us who have wandered in 18th century history know that this is a clue that Bathsheba was a free black woman. Also, Reverend Lawrence was not in the habit of baptizing wandering adults. So it seems almost certain that Mo Bathsheba Moulton was likely a Lincoln resident at the time in 1755. And yet she doesn't appear in the census and she doesn't appear in the subsequent histories of the first church. There was another census in 1765 um, and this time the colony decided to count all black residents. And this time Lincoln reported 20 black males and five black females out of a total population of about 650 people in Lincoln. <clears throat> but this census now made no distinction between enslaved and free. Because enslaved men and women were taxed as property in the 18th century, Lincoln's tax records are also a potential source about who owned slaves and how many there were. But the town's 18th century tax records that have survived are sporadic and they are incomplete. One of the best surviving accounts is from 1774, which is useful because it's just before all of the disruptions of the Revolutionary War. And in the 1774 assessor's records, we find 18 enslaved residents in 14 households. But again, there's no formal tally of free black residents in any systematic way. But I think what we can conclude on the basis of what is available is the following. It appears that the black population of Lincoln, both free and enslaved, adults and children, probably numbered roughly between 20 and 30 at any given time in the years between the town's founding and the end of the revolution. The vast majority of these were, of course, enslaved Black men. Now, 20 to 30 Black residents may seem like a small number. It is, in fact, only 3 to 4 percent of Lincoln's population during that time. It is, however, larger than was the case in all of Massachusetts, where the total population of Blacks was probably only about 2 to 3 percent of the population. But even at three to 4% of Lincoln's population, most, uh, it needs to be noted this way, I think, most of Lincoln's enslaved population lived singly in households. And the average household in Lincoln at that time was seven persons. Put differently, roughly one out of every six Lincoln residents lived in a household side by side with a black person. And many more Lincoln residents would have interacted regularly with a black neighbor. Moreover, even though the free black population was very small, to my mind, it must have posed, it ought to have posed a moral challenge to all the residents of Lincoln. Why were some of these blacks free while others were enslaved? What was the moral justification for the difference between the two? So let me turn now to the question of who were the slave owners in Lincoln, and here I am indebted to the fabulous research work that was done by Jack McLean. In 18th century New England, it was expected that men of social status would own slaves. Um, generally, social status in turn came with a connection to an impressive family background or with wealth, with a college education, with military rank, or a profession such as doctor, lawyer, or clergyman. Uh, social status in Lincoln, however, may have been slightly different, and I, here I'm relying upon the assessor's records in 1774, which tell me about both the wealth of the households as well as where the slave owners were. And it, I just note this, that among the town's 25 wealthiest men in 1774, 10 of them were slave owners. But put that in the reverse direction, and it really states that well over half of the wealthiest men in Lincoln did not own slaves. There were 25 men, 20, excuse me, 23 men in town also who were listed in the records as having honorific titles of one sort or another, and this was an indication of status. 14 of those 23 were slave owners. But again, more than a third of the men with such titles did not own slaves. Nevertheless, in 18th century Lincoln, 
When it came time to elect men to the highest town positions, and those were a selectman or a church deacon, overwhelmingly, the men elected to these positions were slave owners. Just to put that more specifically, each year, the town elected five selectmen. And between 1754 and 1780, in each of those years, selecting five, new, uh, five of, the, of the selectmen, each of those years, 70% of those seats on the select panel went to slave owners. And a similar percentage was also the case for church deacons. Interestingly, militia officers were an apparent exception. There were very few slave owners among militia officers. Of 10 with military titles in 1774, only two had ever been slave owners. In sum, if Lincoln's white residents had any qualms about slavery during the 18th century, it apparently had very little influence upon who they chose as their leaders and who they granted social status deference to. Uh, let me turn now to what it was like to be a black resident in 18th century Lincoln, either enslaved or free. Uh, and here I do want to turn to stories of specific lives. It's occasionally remarked that slavery in New England was less cruel than slavery in the South. Uh, personally, I have to say that on a moral scale, the burden upon the soul and the mind of being treated as property subject to purchase and sale like cattle would seem to overwhelm any other kind of difference in one's life. But nevertheless, let's consider some of the differences between life for blacks in the South and those in Massachusetts. The majority of the enslaved population in the South lived in large black communities and served as farm labor on plantations. As a consequence of their relationship to the land, the fact that they were field workers, their interaction with their white owners was actually quite limited. In fact, their limited uh, exposure of their experience with whites may have been limited quite severely limited, perhaps only to an, uh, one or two of their overseers. As a consequence of this, also of the stability of their lives in a certain sense, the black parents in these plantations might well have their children around them until the children reached adulthood. In Massachusetts, in contrast, the enslaved population typically lived alone or in pairs within white households. In that kind of a setting, Every moment of their lives was subject to scrutiny and a reminder of their lowly status, where enslaved husbands and wives were rarely allowed by their owners to live together, and where their children were commonly separated from their enslaved mothers within months of birth. So I have to ask the question, was life for black residents of Lincoln less cruel? Uh, let me offer you two stories. First is about Peter Nelson. On January 29th of 1765, Deacon Joshua Brooks signed a deed in which he sold, and I'm quoting, a certain Negro servant boy named Peter about one year and seven months old, end quote. He sold Peter to Josiah Nelson of Lincoln for a price of four pounds sterling. As Jack McLean has noted, four pounds sterling at the time was roughly the price of a cow. That was the value in Lincoln of a black child in 1765. Elise Lemire begins her wonderful book, Black Walden, with a similar story about how Lincoln's Elizabeth Hoare acquired Scipio Brister as an enslaved infant. Uh, this trafficking in slave children was common in Massachusetts. Uh, one contemporary at the time noted that some slave ships arrived in Boston Harbor with nothing but children to sell on the docks. On the one hand, children were favored as household slaves because they could be trained to their owner's preferences. On the other hand, if an enslaved woman bore a child, her owner might have no interest in raising yet another slave in a small household just another mouth to feed. And the sale of young Peter by Deacon Joshua Brooks to Josiah Nelson illustrates both of these points. Deacon Brooks had a male slave named Jupiter. 
1756, Jupiter was allowed to marry Peg, who was an enslaved woman in Lexington owned by William Reed. However, despite their marriage, Jupiter and Peg were never allowed by their owners to live together. When Peg nevertheless became pregnant and gave birth to Peter, her child by Massachusetts law belonged to Peg's owner, William Reed. But William Reed had no wish to keep the child, so he turned him over to Deacon Joshua Brooks. Deacon Brooks also had no interest in keeping Peter. Jo Josiah Nelson and his wife Elizabeth, on the other hand, had been married for 14 years and they were childless. So for the price of a cow, they bought young Peter, a toddler, very, barely old enough to walk. You and I can probably imagine the agony of Peter's parents. Peter would be raised in Lincoln, where Jupiter and Peg perhaps might see him occasionally on Sundays, for instance. But these black parents and their children would never live together as a family. We're also bound to wonder what kind of a relationship was now formed between childless Elizabeth Nelson and young Peter. Was Peter being raised as Elizabeth's surrogate child? Or was Peter being raised as property? The answer apparently was that Peter remained property in Josiah Nelson's eyes. Josiah let Peter join the army when the revolution began. And during the war, some of Peter's wages were paid by IOUs that were put into Josiah Nelson's hands. When Peter returned to Lincoln after his military service, he probably intended to use the money to buy land. Land was, after all, one of the very few ways in which Blacks could store up wealth and pass it along to their children. But Josiah refused to give him the money. So far as Josiah was concerned, Peter was still property, and the fruits of Peter's labor belonged to Josiah. Josiah was still holding the money when Peter died 12 years later, and it took Peter's sister years of legal action to finally pry the money loose from Josiah Nelson's hands. So that was an enslaved life. What about the lives of Lincoln's free black families? Did they fare any better? So let me turn to a second story. And this one is about Mary Oliver. Mary Oliver was born in 1742, excuse me, 1742 in the part of Concord that became Lincoln. She was, in short, a legal resident of Lincoln from her birth. Mary is identified in various records as a free mulatto woman. Mary's parents were Peter and Margaret Oliver. I have not been able to trace their origins. All, what I do know is that because Mary was freeborn, we know that her mother at least was free. And it is possible that her mother was also white, though I'm uncertain of that. When Mary reached an appropriate age for marriage, she confronted a problem. Although black males outnumbered black uh, freeborn, excuse me, <clears throat> although black males outnumbered black females in Lincoln and also in the surrounding towns, most black males were enslaved. Enslaved black males, it happens, actually favored freeborn wives because it guaranteed them that their children would be free. But enslaved black men could support a family only if their owners allowed them to earn income of their own, and that was not guaranteed. Despite these obstacles, Mary Oliver gave her heart to Jack Thayer, an enslaved man in the town of Stoneham, and they were married by a justice of the peace in Concord in 1761, and Mary went to live near Jack in Stoneham. And that's when the trouble began. Mary was already several months pregnant when Stoneham Selectman decided to send her back to Lincoln because in that way, Stoneham could avoid any responsibility for her support. Lincoln then got a judge's order sending Mary back to Stoneham and thus began a four year battle between Stoneham and Lincoln over where Mary Oliver would be allowed to live. Stoneham finally prevailed in court and Lincoln was forced to accept Mary Oliver. It cost the Lincoln for this legal battle one third of the town's budget in a year. <laughs> 
During the four-year court battle, Mary had born two daughters and a son. Jack Thayer's owner would not allow Jack to earn enough independent income to support the family. And so Mary and the children were sent back to Lincoln as paupers. And Lincoln then did what the law allowed with paupers. It took Mary's children away from her. The youngest was barely more than a year old. And the town then bound them out to other Lincoln families as apprentices until they reached the age of 18. Well, perhaps if Mary Oliver's children had been placed in authentic apprentices, apprenticeships, they might have prospered in life later on by learning trades, but that is not what happened. When the town placed pauper children with other families, it still had to pay for their upkeep. So it placed them with families who would charge the least for that upkeep. Unsurprisingly, two of Mary's children were placed with families that were already themselves among the poorest in Lincoln including one of the children who was placed with a family that itself ended up on the pauper rolls just a few years later. The oldest daughter, interestingly enough, was placed with a family of the second wealthiest man in town. But he already owned an enslaved woman. And we might well suspect that Mary's daughter was just simply brought in and treated as yet another household servant. So if we compare these two stories of Peter Nelson and of Mary Oliver, Mary Oliver was a freeborn black and so were her children. Yet when she was banned from living with her husband and her children were taken away from her, we have to ask, was freeborn Mary Oliver treated any better than the enslaved Jupiter and Peg whose son Peter was sold to Josiah Nelson for the price of a cow? And how did the enslaved black residents of Lincoln fare when slavery came to an end in Massachusetts? Um, the final chapter, again, I turn to at least recommend to you, Elise Lemire's book, Black Walden. Um, the final chapters really are terrific on the topic of black lives after the revolution. Um, it's a great resource and it's also quite sobering. And I wanna add just one Lincoln story to what Elise has there. And this is a story of Violet Thayer. Violet Thayer was enslaved from her infancy in the household of Ephraim and Elizabeth Hartwell along the North uh, Great Road. Violet's life ought to have been changed in 1783. And that year, a case came before the court in Massachusetts in which an enslaved man, Quack Walker, had filed suit for his freedom claiming that the new Massachusetts constitution banned slavery. Uh, Chief Justice William Cushing agreed and instruct the, instructed the jury, and I quote, I think the idea of slavery is inconsistent with our own conduct and constitution, and there can be no such thing as perpetual servitude in Massachusetts. In effect, Chief Justice William Cushing was saying the court would no longer enforce slavery. 1783. Undeterred, five years later, 1788, when Ephraim Hartwell drew up his will, he included Violet as part of the property that he left to his wife, Elizabeth. When Ephraim died in 1793, his property passed to his widow and most of it to his son, John Hartwell. Violet may well have regarded herself as free by then, but she continued as a servant in the Hartwell household. Violet also did work as a seamstress, and when she died in 1813, Violet had accumulated a modest estate of clothing, some old household items, and cash worth $114. Violet's mother was still alive, but her mother was blind and on the well. And her mother almost certainly would have benefited from whatever was left after Violet's funeral expenses were paid. Instead, Deacon John Hartwell petitioned the probate court for reimbursement for various expenses for Violet, including payments for expenses he said he had incurred five years before Violet died. When all was settled, there was nothing left of Violet's estate. Deacon John Hartwell paid himself all of what remained and Violet's mother got nothing. Deacon John Hartwell, whose total property was valued at more than $4,000, took the last $82 of Violet's estate. He apparently thought that was just 
and the probate laws allowed him to do it. That was what the end of slavery was like for Violet Thayer. Uh, let me turn now to the role of Lincoln's only church, the first church, uh, in the lives of Lincoln's black residents. Um, you may be reminded here of some points by the Reverend Jenny Rankin that she made at her last sermon last Sunday. Um, most blacks would not have heard in Massachusetts would not have heard a welcoming message from the pulpits in New England's conservative congregational churches in the 18th century. And I'm reminded of an episode, for example, in the town of Deerfield, where the Reverend Jonathan Ashley gathered the towns enslaved together on a cold January evening in 1749 for a tedious sermon that had a preamble, uh, five main headings and 27 subheadings. Uh, for those slaves who managed to stay awake during the sermon, the sermon's theme was quite clear. The church endorses slavery. You should accept it as God's will and be thankful and look to the hereafter for your happiness, not here. Uh, Lincoln's own first church may have been more welcoming than that. Uh, granted, when the church was formed in 1747, at least eight of the 25 original signers of the church covenant were slaveholders. Their first minister, which as their first minister, the uh, church uh, founder selected Reverend William Lawrence. He was 25 years old, still a bachelor, had a master of divinity degree from Harvard. Reverend Lawrence was an old light, uh, theologically conservative, and he was selected precisely because it was believed he would hew to church tradition. Reverend Lawrence, during his long career in Lincoln, delivered more than 1,600 sermons, but copies of only six of those sermons survived, so we can't know whether he ever delivered a sermon in defense of slavery, as the Reverend Ashley did in Deerfield. However, Reverend Lawrence kept a record of the biblical passages that he used as the basis of his sermons throughout his uh, career, and I've reviewed those, uh, that, those lists. And none of the passages for his sermons were among those that were favored by apologists for slavery. So I doubt he ever delivered such a sermon. It appears to me at least that Reverend Lawrence was no apologist for slavery. And I also think that history may also do him an injustice in labeling him as a slave owner. I can also note that during Reverend Lawrence's ministry, 32 years, he baptized 19 black children and adults, and that included 11 enslaved blacks. He married three black enslaved couples, six black residents owned the covenant, and one black woman named Kate was received into full communion, which meant that she would share quite literally and physically share the communion cup with her white co-parishioners. We can't make a great deal of these numbers. After all, church attendance was compulsory in the 18th century, and it was slave owners actually who decided whether the children of their slaves would be baptized. Still, it is notable that at least a few blacks of their own choice got married in the church, owned the covenant, and one at least sought full communion in the first church under Reverend Lawrence's leadership. Nevertheless, I think one has to say it is a hard fact. The deacons of the church and those who were granted pride of place in the front pews of the church were Lincoln's slave owners. This was not a church that condemned slavery in the 18th century. And even Kate, the one black woman who was admitted to full communion, nevertheless remained enslaved to Deacon Samuel Farrer. Let me finish with asking the question or posing the question, which I hope we can turn to in discussion, and that is, well, all right, what lesson does any of this 18th century Lincoln history hold for us today? Uh, inevitably, when I'm delving into 18th century lives, I find myself asking, what were they thinking? I might know what they were doing, but without knowing what they were thinking, it can be very difficult to interpret what they were doing. And it's difficult enough for the modern mind to comprehend how those of Lincoln who were not slave owners 
explain to themselves why it was acceptable, for instance, for their own church deacons to engage in the buying and selling of innocent children. It's even more difficult to comprehend how those who are not slave owners manage to avert their eyes and harden their hearts to the many ways, both blatant and subtle, both social and legal, the many ways by which they prevented even their free black neighbors from thriving in their lives. And then the next question I find myself asking is whether a hundred years from now, our own descendants looking back at us will ask that same question. How did we veil our eyes and harden our hearts to the subtle and blatant ways that we may have prevented members of our own community from thriving? And with that, I welcome discussion. So I have muted everyone. So if you would like to um, ask a question of Don, you'll have to unmute yourself. And I trust that you know how to do that. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Don. That was gripping. Uh, and I know that many people are going to have uh, questions to ask you. Um, I'm just trying to get the gallery up here. Yes. And I hope people will um, let their faces be seen and then uh, uh, also uh, put your hands up or use the, uh, the little hand. Don, can I ask a question while we're getting, uh, while people are, are getting uh, positioned to bring their questions? How did attacks on uh, the ownership of human beings work? in the 18th century? How was it calculated? How was it collected? What? Uh, it was in the town of Lincoln, it was essentially collected by the constables and the amount of the tax, um, the, the uh, colony set a province tax, um, but the town itself set its own budget and also set its own tax. You go to the tax records, essentially you'll find long columns in the assessor's uh, sheets starts with slaves and it goes to oxen, horses, cows, etc. Uh, there was a value placed on each one of them and that value was tallied up. I've tried Mary to go backwards at least to the extent that I can and it's not very easy to do to find out specifically how much slaves in Lincoln were taxed at any given point. Um, I'm working on that. I hope to have some indication mm -hmm. of the value but at the moment I'm not really sure what it is. I mean, I, I found myself thinking that it was something uh, uh, analogous to our current excise taxes. If we have an automobile that's worth a lot or that's worth a little, we're taxed for that. Uh, I mean, otherwise we have property tax, um, but this is so, sort of uh, in, in the case of uh, servants who, who are owned, uh, who are in bondage, uh, it, uh, I mean, it, it, it is kind of a luxury item uh, for the residents of In, in instances in England. which uh, mm -hmm. a man's property went to probate, there would be an mm -hmm. assessment to the value of the property. And the assessors at that point would put a label on what they judge to be the value of a particular slave. As you might expect, it varied widely depending on whether they were robust young men or older women, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but even there, it can be very difficult to tell what, what that value means, um, in part because the currency values fluctuate so widely back at the time and the, the value of slaves mm -hmm. varied from place to place as well. So mm -hmm. it's... Uh, <laughs> You know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we ask the question, and yet, in a certain sense, you sort of feel uncomfortable. Uh, this mm -hmm. valuation of human beings, uh, particularly small children. Well, that is, yeah, and of course, then there's the the sale of these uh, human beings. That is, I find absolutely chilling. Um, but I don't want to go on. I see that. Emily and Tom have a question. 
and Pam and Ken. So Emily and Tom. Um, thank you, <clears throat> Don. Thank you so much for um, a really uh, wonderful presentation discussion. I was curious if there's any evidence at all in the town of Lincoln of um, black children being given an education. Uh, it, I can't know for sure, but it's interesting that when the, uh, the town selectmen put Mary Oliver's children out to other families to raise, they didn't specify that they were being put into indentured servitude. They specified that they were being put into apprenticeships. <clears throat> this didn't make a whole lot of sense because these were girls. So they weren't gonna learn a, they weren't gonna learn a trade. But the laws of Massachusetts were very strict with respect to apprenticeships to avoid children generally from being exploited. And among the stipulations was that the master who was taking on the apprentice had to provide the apprentice with an education and had to allow the apprentice free time to attend school. Even at that, Lincoln was fairly vigorous in having uh, schooling for girls during the summertime, um, but only during the summertime. And the general practice was certainly to, to teach girls how to read but not necessarily how to write. Um, now, did in fact the families that had these children send them off to school? That we do not know. At least I don't know it yet, Tom. Thank you very much. Pam and Ken. Thanks, Mary. Um, hi, Don. Um, I, I really appreciate this odd thing here. Um, really appreciate your your talk and wondered if if it's not too uh, too bold. If if I could ask you to share a little bit about your motivation. Uh, you know, we're all on this journey of discovery of Lincoln's past and trying to claim, acknowledge, uh, repair, and and build the future. Um, so I'm. I'm very curious if, if you would be willing to share how you come to this uh, to this journey yourself and um, and motivations. A um, couple of my things, Pam, um, during much of my career as a college professor, one of my particular passions was to work with first generation students because I was such myself. Uh, and as you can imagine, oh, particularly in the last decades, couple of decades, the majority of first generation students were students of color. Um, so that, you know, I've always had an interest in that. When I was doing uh, writing about William Smith's, uh, the biography for William Smith, one of the black residents of Lincoln was of course Cato, who was William Smith's slave. And tracing that backward, um, I found, you know, hadn't anticipated it. But William Smith's father was the minister in Weymouth, Massachusetts. And he, William Smith's slave Cato, his father bought Cato at the age of 10 off the docks in Boston and seemed to be quite proud of himself because he had actually gotten a bargain. He talked the, sale, the seller of the slave down by about 10 pounds. So Cato joined the other slaves in Reverend Smith's household. So Abigail Adams, who was after all William Smith's sister, Abigail Adams grew up in a household that had slaves in it. Um, when William got married, Reverend Smith just simply transferred Cato to William. Uh, William and Cato probably had spent no more than a couple of days together uh, because William had been off at school uh, when Cato was in the house. There was just something about that um, that made me damn mad. And I thought there are lives here in Lincoln that were of importance and nobody's heard their stories and they need a voice. And that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you, Don, really appreciate that. Um, Sarah, Cannon Holden, do I see your hand up? You're muted, Sarah. I think you're muted. Yeah, I'm all set now, thank you, thank you. And thank you, Don, very much. It was 
so interesting to hear this history. I mean, we're just all so, or I am so ignorant about, about this. Um, and I was curious, is, are there, is there any, where were um, black slaves or were they buried? And is there any record of them in any of our graveyards? We, we know they were buried because there are records indicating that they were. Violet Thayer, for example, was buried. Uh, um, the, the probate record indicates that she, a coffin was purchased for her, she, clothes were found to bury her in, and so on. There's only one former enslaved person who we know for certain where the person was buried, and that's Scipio Brister, because there's a headstone there for him. Really as, for the rest, as for the rest of them, if, if people know where they are buried, I certainly would like to know it, but I don't, uh, there's no record. And is that the person you mentioned buried in Lincoln? He is buried in Lincoln. Where? But I, but I would note this, well, he's buried out in the old uh, uh, burial ground that's out along Lexington Road, uh, the so-called second precinct burial ground. But I would note this. Um, with the Lincoln Minutemen hold a ceremony out there every year to honor both uh, patriots that are buried there, including Scipio Brister, because he served during the war, uh, and also the British soldiers that are buried out there. Yeah. Um, when the Bar British soldiers were buried out there, they were not buried in what was the proper portion of the old burial ground. Because, of course, you wouldn't bury your enemy in the same area where you buried your heroes and your town fathers and etc. When it came time for Scipio Brister to be buried, guess where Scipio Brister was buried? <laughs> yeah, well. Where? He was buried well, alongside the British well, soldiers. The British, yeah, exactly. I wonder what the British <laughs> soldiers are thinking about that. That's interesting. And what is the last name, Brister or Brewster? Uh, Brister, B R I S T E R. Okay, thank you. At least, am I remembering that that was a, a version of Bristol, which was a town after which some slaves were named? Yes, absolutely. That there's we know that was a very popular name for enslaved men, and it is a version of Bristol, and it was a way of the enslaver to show his cosmopolitanism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the I might mention. One of the challenges in trying to trace these lives is, as you can well imagine, if you've not only been given some given a name, not your choice, but you've been given a name, and then if you changed owners, or even if the owner changed his mind, he could give you another name entirely. By the time you finally got your freedom, one of the first things you might want to shed was those damn names. And... Uh. It makes it very difficult, therefore, to try and trace some of these people. I'll give you another example, Jack Thayer, who is the legal husband of Mary Oliver. Well, Jack Thayer uh, wanted to serve in the military. It was a way in which he, like uh, uh, Peter Nelson, could earn some money and possibly then be able to support his family, buy some land, have a, have a better life. His owner refused to allow Jack to do that. And so Jack did a very sensible thing. He ran away. But once he ran away, he was not going to be Jack Thayer any longer. Mm -hmm. And so where did Jack Thayer go and where did Mary Oliver go? I'll keep tracing them, but I know it's going to be awfully hard to find them. But good for them. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll see. Barbara had her hand up. Barbara yes. Slater. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, goodness. Thank you so much. This has just been absolutely fascinating. And I knew nothing <laughs> about the... Uh, slavery during that period, but I had a question about Peter's sister. You said it took her four years um, to get the money that had been due Peter, but she got it. And that was a, an intriguing tidbit. And I wondered if you had more on the circumstances under which she was able to do that and how it all happened. Uh, Barbara, I'm still trying to trace that. Um, there's at least some preliminary indication that there are a couple of in influential white men in Lincoln who uh, assisted her in it. Um, but that's preliminary findings, and I, I hate to say it's true yet. I hope it's true, um, but I don't know for certain. But, uh, you know, it does say something, and that is at least the law occasionally worked in favor. Um, 
of people who otherwise were being you know, dealt not what I would regard as a fair hand. Thank you. Uh, Joan. I, I had a quest, question. Um, somewhere, and it may have been from Elise, but or it may have been some other place, but I uh, had have the idea that Cotton Mather felt it was very important uh, to baptize slaves. And it seemed to me that one of the reasons was, you know, Christian Christianity might make them more better, better servants, and then, then they would have heaven at the very end. And do we have any knowledge of how many slave children were baptized in our church and and later sold? Is this something that that was oh. happening that they were? Um, that's a very good question, uh, Joan, because in some measure, the numbers that we have of uh, black residents of Lincoln don't seem to add up. There almost surely were more children or should have been more children. And the stability of the black population suggests that something became of them. But I don't know what, I don't yet know. And that's one of the things that I, uh, that I wanna trace. Thank you. And this has been a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. And it's evident that there's a great deal of interest because there've been 74 people here today, which is really a great tribute. Very nice. 74 screens, which means there are many more people. I'm looking for hands. And if you aren't being recognized and want to, just say something and we'll find you. Yeah. Hi. And we can't find you if your screen is black. That's true. Um, Janet Boynton here. I was curious, um, Mr. Hafner, if in all of your research, you had any statistics about abolitionists in Lincoln and were they, how were they interacting with the slave owners at the time? Just uh, uh, my wife laughs because I frequently remark, I can only do one century at a time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't know the, that much about the abolitionists in Lincoln. Yeah. There, is a, there is a curious episode that occurred in uh, 1755. It's noted in, uh, in Reverend Styron's uh, history of the first church. Um, it, there came a point, uh, occasionally pews in the, in the meeting house were allocated according to property. Mm -hmm. And that meant from time to time that it was necessary to re -pew, or reseat the pews in the, uh, in the meeting house. And in 1755, that was done. But the vote to do that included a phrase that it would be done on the basis of men's property, excluding yeah. slaves. Mm. Now, I can't believe that that really made all that much difference in who got the front pews. Yes. But it may suggest something about a kind of seething animosity running in the town at the time. Mm -hmm. that you may still end up with a pew in the front, but I'll be damned if I'm going to let you have it because you own human beings. Yes. But I'm not sure, you know, one of the problems that one has with uh, looking at town meeting records, for example, is that they record the decisions, but not necessarily the reasoning and the arguments. Yeah. And so we're, we're left to try and piece things together. But um, I'm on the trail and I, uh, I hope, hope to be able to learn more about that. It's possible it happened in other towns and there may be better histories that tell us something about what's going on. Thank you. Oh, Sherry, hey, Doc. Hi, uh, this has been a great talk. Um, you mentioned that in the South, most many of the slaves worked as field hands. I was interested in knowing what the role of slaves were in agriculture um, in, in Lincoln uh, or what their duties were and how were they different from what the slaves in the South were asked to do? Um, Sherry, I'm not entirely certain, to, but I can infer <clears throat> that uh, they were generally men and single men in households. And that, and when I look at the land holdings of the at least some of the uh, the slave owners, they're not terribly impressive land holdings. These look like 
the head of household worked the fields himself and that the slaves also helped in working the fields. Um, that's the best I can do right at the moment in inferring uh, what was the case. The men who had titles, um, you know, Dr. Charles Russell, for example, titles generally indicated a profession, which meant that these were men who prided themselves on the fact that they did not work the fields. And so the slaves in those households were undoubtedly either field hands themselves under direction, or in some instances, probably working in within the household. Okay. Thank you. Jennifer Glass. I think Dave Levington had his hand up before I did. So I will defer to Dave and then I will be happy to go. I was just been very wonderfully helpful. I was curious about military service. Uh, it seems that uh, slaves uh, fought either with their masters or alone. I wonder if they appear in the town records uh, who served. Uh, they do. Uh, you do need to know who they are in order to see them. But the town did vote bonuses for those who served in the military and those bonuses were paid out and they're recorded in the, uh, in the town tr uh, treasurer's record, uh, records. Um, so that they did serve right, right off the top of my head, Dave. I don't remember the totality of those that did serve, but uh, there were uh, Juba Savage, for example, freed slave of Samuel uh, Savage of Weston. Uh, uh, Cato, of course, Cato Smith served. Uh, both of the slaves in the horror household, both Cuff and Brister served. Um, I'm sorry, my memory right at the moment of the others is faulty right at the moment, but they, they did serve. A couple of us were trying to study Mr. Cummings, became Mr. Freeman. Yes. Right. He would show the records of Concord. He if would. He, if yes. He still yeah. served once as Mr. Cummings and once as Mr. Freeman. Mm. The, uh, you may be aware that um, as the war dragged on, it became increasingly difficult to staff the Continental Army with volunteers. And so a draft system was uh, devised in which the, if, uh, the town's quota, which was based on its population, happened to be, let's say, that it had to produce 12 men, then the total uh, male population above the age of 16 was divided into 12 classes. And each one of those classes had to come up either with one among themselves who would volunteer to serve, or they had to hire somebody else to do so. And this was a great opportunity for blacks to serve um, because in many instances, for example, if it turned out that uh, their owner happened to be in the class, the owner might be interested in having the slave serve instead of himself um, in the case of Josiah Nelson, you do wonder whether he wanted Cato to go into the military precisely so he could collect Cato's wages, uh, excuse me, Peter's wages. Um, so this was an opportunity for blacks to serve and the percentage of blacks then rose constantly during, uh, steadily during the war, uh, much to the notice of our British and Hessian and opponents and our French allies were astonished at the percentage, as they saw it anyway, of black faces uh, armed to the teeth and in the army of the American uh, colonies. Mm. Thank you. Now, Jennifer. Thank you. And thank you, Don, for um, turning your anger into constructive research and bringing it to us and teaching us. Um, I have a question, actually, I guess for all of us that doesn't need an answer tonight, but I, I hope will become perhaps a community conversation about how do we make this history visible? And I'm hearing some, some names that are connected to our institutions in town. And I'm thinking about how we might take this history and possibly think about, um, how we name things or how we honor people or how we raise awareness um, in addition to listening to such um, 
fine talks as we've listened to this evening. So no answer expected, but um, I think it's something for us all to, to think about uh, in the coming years as we, as we wrestle with these hard truths and figure out how to acknowledge the history in a, uh, in a more public way. So thank you. Oh, thank you. I agree. It, um, again, part of my motivation in trying to track this down, uh, the stories of these people, just so that we know more about it, more about them and more about their role um, in Lincoln's own history. Sarah Mattis has a question. Yes, thank you, Don. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that you might also um, illuminate us a bit more on the role of one of the largest landholders and owners of enslaved people who live down the road, in essence, from the Hartwells and all, and who has a rather interesting, horrifying history with regard to enslaved people. And in his case in particular, and I'm re referring to Chambers Russell, mm -hmm. um, who secured Lincoln's independence from Concord and other towns to become its own community. Um, you've, you spoke to the fact that, um, given your research, that the, the, in, the owners of one or two people were not necessarily relying on them to farm the land, but to insist, assist in it. But um, could you please discuss a little bit about uh, Chambers Russell and his enslaved people and the role and, and his role as a slave owner and a, somebody in politics? He was certainly the largest slaveholder in Lincoln. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> You know, the total number of enslaved people that passed through uh, that estate, uh, I, I don't know completely. I do know the following. When Chambers Russell died, um, his estate passed to, to uh, Charles Russell, Dr. Charles Russell. And when Dr. Charles Russell uh, took the hint of a musket bullet through his coach, to decide that maybe being in Lincoln in around 1775 was not altogether healthy for him. He fled into Boston and then from there to Antigua. And then he died in Antigua. Um, probate, well, the uh, colony's intention at that point was to confiscate property of loyalists. And so uh, inventory was done of his property. Uh, at that time, there were still some number, at least, of six black men who Judge Russell had stipulated should remain on his estate and not be sold. So there was a continuity across a considerable period of time here of black people, black males at least, and I'm sure there were women as well, who served on that estate. Um, Again, the, the records are, are incomplete, um, but I'm hoping that I'll be able to dig out a good deal more um, about them. But I'm not sure that answers your question, Sarah, but it, you know, it, 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 it clearly was interesting that uh, this was the man who, I mean, uh, who served uh, both Judge Russell, as you note, in uh, helping found the town. And then Charles Russell served as the moderator of the town for many, many years until he was finally booted out on the, on the brink of the, uh, of the revolution. So clearly the most distinguished family in town. And uh, I would ask if you could illuminate a little bit more, flesh out that story of, of um, what he did in his judicial capacity. I, I know Elise told some of that story, has told that story, but, and it's been told by uh, Wendy Hubbard at the um, Codman House. But I think for those here, that might be of interest in, um, in illuminating just how horrifying uh, much of these 
the conduct of many of these people. Um, Elise, you, you know that story in some measure a little bit better than I do because it starts off in Concord rather than in Lincoln. Do you want to pitch in here? Yeah, I think you're referring, Sarah, to the story uh, that took place in Boston, right? Yes. At John Codman's uh, house yes. where yes. two of the people enslaved to him poisoned him. And one, the woman was burned at the stake, which of course is a horrific way to be killed. And um, I mean, in other words, you, you suffer before you pass away. And the man was hanged. And I'm sorry, I think this is what you're referring to. Yeah. And then his yeah. corpse was gibbeted on the main road out of Charlestown, out to the Western, what we now would call the Western suburbs. His corpse was tarred and gibbeted and, and hanged there for decades, a couple of decades, if I'm remembering correctly. In other words, and I see, um, I, I see, Don, your copy of um, David Hackett Fisher's Paul Revere's Ride behind your shoulder. Oh, well, yes, of course. That's a good place to read about it because Paul Revere does report passing um, that gibbeted corpse, but that was there as a warning to the enslaved that if you try to foment any kind of uprising or run away, um, this is what could happen to you. So in terms of the brutality of this, of course, this story is a is, is horrific insofar as a, a, a corpse was, was desecrated and used in this manner to strike fear um, mm -hmm. into, the, into the hearts of the enslaved population of the greater Boston area. And that it was Chambers Russell who passed down that sentence. Yeah. I mean, that's, what, that's something that we have to own and process. Mm -hmm. I might add, some of us are particularly concerned since we live in the Chambers Russell House here at the Commons. Yeah. I'll leave that one to you, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's asked me about what I said, about my uh, quick comment about how history may have done uh, Reverend uh, Lawrence an injustice and regarding him as a slave owner. Anybody want to take up on yes. that? Yes, we would like to save that for later. No, 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 tell us more. I was hoping you would. Yeah, the, and I'm not trying to be an apologist for Reverend Lawrence, but at least let me uh, uh, put some facts before you and let, let an, an objective world decide. Um, as I noted to you, the, the slave, Cumbo, came into his household um, because his wife had been given Cumbo when her mother died. Her mother died was, her mother was the wife of Edward Flint. And it was Edward Flint who originally purchased Cumbo. Uh, we don't know a great, well, as I noted to you, we don't know very much about Cumbo at all. Her name though is African. And that may suggest that she was brought to Boston and, and secured uh, when, and was purchased when she was somewhat older rather than a child, but that's not, that's not entirely certain. In any case, Cumbo was in the household when Reverend Lawrence's wife was growing up. And so when Reverend Lawrence's wife, uh, when her, her mother, Love Flint, died and gave her daughter Cumbo, in a certain sense, there probably was a sentimental attachment between the two, between Reverend Lawrence's wife and Cumbo. It's also worth noting that Cumbo died six years later. I don't know whether that was a death as a result of disease or something, or because we know nothing about her age, it's possible that Cumbo, by the time she came into the Lawrence household, was actually quite old and possibly also sick in one way or another. Now you and I, so you might look at that and say, well, Reverend Lawrence was just simply showing compassion. He was taking in somebody who had no place else to go and making certain that she was supported in a proper fashion. You and I might ask though, well, okay, fine. But Lincoln slave owners understood how important freedom was to slaves because what was the last thing they did? They granted freedom to their slaves. I mean, obviously they understood this. So why didn't Reverend Lawrence just simply let Cumbo be free? 
even if she continued to live in his household. <clears throat> Is it worth knowing that Massachusetts had a law which said that if you emancipate a slave, you must post a bond of 50 pounds sterling with the town. And that was, it's, the ostensible purpose was if that freed slave then becomes poor and has to be supported by the town, at least the town then can draw upon that bond in order to support them. The real reason for it was by making the bond so high, it was intended really to discourage people from having slaves. Uh, this was something that was originally adopted at the beginning of the 18th century when there was a real interest in keeping Massachusetts white. And this was at least one method that was thought uh, that might accomplish that. So 50 pounds sterling is what it would have cost Reverend Lawrence to post that bond. Reverend Lawrence's salary from the town was 62 pounds sterling. So turning Cumbo loose would have cost Reverend Lawrence almost the equivalent of a year's salary. I don't know what Reverend Lawrence's view was about the justifications of slavery, but I don't know, but it also may be pertinent to note that through most of his career, despite being the kind of person and in the social strata where it would have been expected that he had a slave, virtually all clergymen in Massachusetts did have a slave. During that long period, Reverend Lawrence did not acquire a slave. So I just leave that for your own judgment. Don, is there information um, available, and I may have missed this in other writings like Elise's, um, is there information about uh, enslaved people purchasing their freedom uh, in this area? That it hasn't entered uh, your, the, the stories that you have told. I'm not aware of any yet, Mary, in Lincoln. Uh, mm -hmm. There certainly are stories of slaves, excuse me, of free people, free blacks purchasing spouses yeah. out of slavery. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not aware of, uh, there were two married couples in free married, well, half of them at least, Salem Middlesex married to Violet and uh, Will, William Phyllis married to Mary. Um, I haven't been able to determine the status yet of their spouses at the time those marriages took place. So I don't know whether those were instances in which they purchased their spouses out of slavery. But Elise, are you familiar with either of them? Or Ray, do you know? Okay. This is Ray, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Mary, I'm, I, I hope uh, soon um, that I will have all of this written up and we'll all be able to have it at our fingertips, but uh, yeah. it's a yeah. lot of digging. I'm thoroughly enjoying it, not least I love puzzles, but it's also very rewarding to find out about who these people were and what their mm -hmm. lives were like, so uh, I'm working on it. This is, I, Diana I has a question. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh sorry, Elise. But you go first, and then I'll ask. Hey, Diana, do you want to go first? Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting and stimulating talk. And it's good for all of us to be reminded that uh, slavery was not just a Southern phenomenon. Um, and I was curious when you referred earlier to town meeting laws, uh, town meeting conversation and records here in town. Um, have, have you come across the first reference, what was the first reference to either slavery and town meeting discussion, if ever, or the first black participant in town meeting, if there ever was one? Is there any record at all of Blacks being involved either as part of the conversation or as the topic in Lincoln Town Meeting records? Uh, there certainly was discussion, well, a couple of things. Um, 
Lincoln made real efforts whenever there were transient black pop, transient populations period passing through Lincoln, made efforts to do what was referred to back then as warning out, uh, posting a legal notice that they were supposed to leave the town. And some of those fairly early on refer to those who are being asked to leave either having with them a black child or being themselves black. Um, I mentioned, uh, for example, Bathsheba Moulton, surnamed Moulton. Um, she apparently was a transient and was subsequently warned out of Weston when she went there from Lincoln. So there, those mentions do come up in the official records. Um, you wouldn't have been able to participate in town meeting as a black person, I don't think, any time in the 18th century. And so in that sense, Diane, I don't know when it, when it might have become possible, but uh, it was not then. I also note to you, um, it, it's often remarked, uh, I hear it from time to time, oh, Massachusetts outlawed slavery in 1783. Uh, sometimes people say it was 1781. That was the first of the court cases, but not the final. That wasn't when Chief Justice Cushing made his statement. Massachusetts technically never outlawed slavery. It just simply died. Uh, it became clear, as a, to some at least, as a result of Justice Cushing's remark that if they challenged their slavery or just simply went away, no one would be able to enforce a slave contract. Uh, but when did people hear of it? You know, How long did it take? Evidently, Ephraim Hartwell never heard of it five years later because he decided to give Violet away as property. Um, <laughs> So it, I think the last case I'm aware of was sometime in 1813 when a woman tried to give away her household servant as a slave to her progeny. So the word got around late. It's also remarked from time to time that, well, if you go to the first federal census in 1790, there are no slaves in Massachusetts. Well, Jeremy Belknap uh, tells the story that the reason why that was the case was that the people who were doing the census were told, make it clear to people that maybe they shouldn't mention that they have slaves. So in short, the census data was cooked to make it appear that there were no people still in bondage or apparent bondage in Massachusetts. So again, reasons why blacks would not be popping up in town meeting. And, uh, and participating. I could be wrong, Diana. I've got to check on the free blacks to find out whether there may have been some exceptions, but I don't think there were. Mm -hmm. Elise, you yeah, were. Yeah, first of all, Don, thank you so much for this wonderfully informative talk and, and also just for your incredible sensitivity to um, the, 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 the hardships that the enslaved population of Lincoln endured. So I was struck by the fact that two of the, the couples who married, who you described, married um, people in other towns. And I, I was wondering like, how did people meet each other? And, and clearly uh, people seem to have been searching for, for spouses or prospective romantic partners uh, of perhaps of their own race or their own experience. Yeah. I was wondering, well, how could you figure out the kinds of events and does this mean there was a, a black community that was maybe countywide or um, says something about res the, the resilience of the community and so far as they're able to foster social events and, and meet prospective romantic partners. I was thinking maybe you could compare um, or look at, uh, look at white intra-racial marriages in Lincoln and notice how often people married someone from within the same town. I mean, I know Abigail, um, uh, who, the, the woman who marries John Cummings, of course she marries, you know, she's in Lincoln, he's in Concord, but a lot of people in Lincoln married other white people in Lincoln. So I thought oh, maybe yeah. that would be a way to get at it, but I'm really intrigued by this question of, you know, are they meeting each other at the marketplace somewhere in, in Boston or how are they, how are people meeting each other such that they're, they're, these marriages are taking place between towns? 
Uh, it's a wonderful question, Elise, and particularly when uh, Mary Oliver from Lincoln married uh, Jack Thayer from Stoneham. That's a considerable distance. That's four hours in a wagon. Um, and, you know, that's not a casual afternoon. Um, but it actually, in some measure, makes me giggle because you see things like that and you know there was a rich Black community going on in Lincoln and elsewhere in the 18th century. And in the main, we know nothing about it, except that occasionally we see the events that mark it. And uh, so I'm, I'm hoping more and more of that will become evident as I look deeper and deeper into this. But uh, meeting in church certainly was something that was feasible. Uh, Jupiter and Peg, for instance, undoubtedly met in the Lexington church because uh, church attendance was obligatory. Uh, but there must have been a vast social network of Black people that uh, brought them into contact with each other um, and likely also not under the scrutiny of their owners so that there was a certain freedom involved in it. We know that certainly was true in Boston, but there the proximity is so easy. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit more out into the hinterland, it must have been more of a challenge. But damn it all, Mary Oliver figured it out somehow. It, uh, and, 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 just, and Emily just, have a question. Just to Sorry. add to it, not only did she figure it out, but the, she managed to figure it out and get pregnant in the process. So, John, I, I apologize <laughs> for asking um, two questions this evening, but I can't resist the temptation. Um, I'm doing the math in my head, which means I'm probably off. Um, my question is grounded in how much of Lincoln's wealth is on the back of enslaved people. And by my rough count, I'm guessing that from the numbers you shared earlier, as much as 10% of the men over 16 working in the fields were, were probably enslaved people. And my, and my question is, I've heard story of enslaved people building barns and that these groups of, of men were hired in large numbers to construct these beautiful, wonderful structures that you know still populate the New England landscape. And I'm just curious if you have any sense from an economic point of view, beyond the 10%, which is my back of the envelope math, which may be wrong, what was the dependency in the wealth formation in Lincoln on enslaved people? Is anyone taken a look at that to sort of really quantify how much of our quote heritage is, is a, as a consequence of enslavement? Tom, that's an excellent question. Um, from the Assessor's records, we know something about what portion of the town's total wealth uh, reposed in households that had slaves. That doesn't exactly answer the question, but it, uh, it may get us a little closer. And it was substantial. Uh, most of the slave owners, most of them, um, slave owners had estates that were assessed in 1774 at above 150 pounds sterling. Um, that's a lot of cash. Um, it also is the case, and I don't know if you're alluding to it or not, owners of slaves could and did rent them out to other people. Mm -hmm. And often they were hired by other slave owners. Um, in part because other slave owners had no objection whatsoever to using indentured or, uh, servants for life and adding to their wealth. Uh, Jack Thayer was probably rented out by his owner, for example. Uh, what's unclear to me because it's not part of the records is, and when that happened, how much of that labor went to the slave and how much of it went to the owner. Um, but there was a market in slave labor, the, a rental market in slave labor at the time, yeah. Well, there's a Don, question there's a the question chat. in the I was just going, I think we're going for the same thing, Joan. There's a question in the chat yeah. from Kathy Moritz and Bob Wadsworth asking where you find your information. Uh, rooting around in records, um, the, the uh, treasurer's records have been very helpful. Uh, the church records are very helpful. Court records can be very helpful. Uh, as you might suppose, we don't have diaries. Um, 
We don't have letters, uh, except in so far as they might obliquely refer to black people. Uh, so it's a real scramble. It's, it's very difficult. And uh, as I say, sometimes my wife has to put up with me because every now and again, I will spot something and it'll suddenly make sense to me. Um, she's compared it to somebody who has figured out on the New York Times crossword Sunday, Sunday crossword puzzle, what 15 across actually is. So I'm, I, you know, I don't know how many times I've looked at Reverend Lawrence's uh, uh, records, for example. It was only a couple of days ago that I came across crossed Bathsheba surnamed molten adult. And all of a sudden, ah, now I understand what that is. Um, but that's a consequence of, of having a lot of experience with what the records back at that time were like and what people were saying and so on. There are, are moments when I feel like I actually uh, probably could wander around the, if time travel were possible, could wander the, the roads of Lincoln and greet people uh, as in, oh, Samuel Hartwell, well, what about that son you've never acknowledged? Talk to me about him. <laughs> Did Pam and uh, Ken, do you have another question? Barbara Lowe does, but she went mm -hmm. away. Oh, sorry. I think I saw Pam and Ken with their hands up. Or maybe no. You, you no, did. I had, it, I had it up. I had it up and put it down. Shall I go? Yes, please. Don, this has been terrific. Um, I, I just hope you're going to move into the 19th century as well. Because well, I don't know, Ken. One century <laughs> at a time. I, I would love to know more about uh, what, you know, what conditions were like once um, you know, slavery, the ownership of, of people was not in favor. Yeah. What free Blacks do, how did they live? But also, Good I question. just know more about the abolitionists and how they, and how they, um, the part they played in Lincoln and the church and its part. Yeah, and I, um, you know, first off, I would send you to Elise's book, Black Walden, because she has wonderful chapters about how uh, Blacks who gained their freedom immediately around Lincoln uh, managed to live their lives in the different lives they made. Yeah, there, there's another book uh, by Joanne Ma uh, Pope Malish uh, called Disowning Slavery, which is extremely good, um, but with a caveat, it is academic history. And uh, although it's quite readable and very interesting, um, it can be, uh, it will do this to you. It will make you damn mad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, ways in, the ways in which, less Massachusetts, but certainly Rhode Island and Connecticut, drag their feet in putting an end to slavery is just exceedingly difficult to understand except by saying they were making money off of other human beings and that's why they were so reluctant to give up the habit. It sounds like capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> Today. Some <laughs> things don't change. Yeah, so the low- Steve, Steve and Barbara, did you have a question? Yeah, I think we both were curious about the, this this topic, actually, and that is the end of slavery in Lincoln. So I, I don't know to what degree there's any knowledge about this, but if there is, you could share it with us. And that is, you know, when did slavery end? How did it end in Lincoln? When was the last slave in Lincoln? Um, when was the last black person living in Lincoln until the modern era? And when slaves left uh, uh, slavehood? I guess they slavery. How did they? How did they support themselves? What? What? What did they do to, to uh, you know, to find a home? And and what were the economics of being a, a next slave like in those days before the forty mules and a, and a you know forty acres and a mule uh, at the Civil Fair War? <laughs> That's the question. Big question. At least that question was misdirected. It goes to you. Uh, well, I, the, I, one thing I wanted to mention too, just as another book recommendation, Don is, um, and I, I can't think of the author's name, but it's the it's the biography of Phyllis Wheatley, because of course she was she. You you talked about how children were shipped 
you know, were stolen from their parents, from their families um, on the Western coast of Africa and showed up on the docks in Boston. Phyllis Wheatley, of course, purchased by the Wheatley family. That's how we have her last name. Her first name is the name of the ship she came on. We have no idea what her parents mm -hmm. named her. She was enslaved, of course, wrote as a poem, as a poet during, during that time. And then she was, she was uh, given her freedom. I, I, I don't like that syntax, but at any rate, um, it's a wonderful biography to read. And I'll put the author's name in the chat because she of course died impoverished and she is buried in the old granary um, cemetery in Boston, but in an unmarked grave. So, I mean, the story of what happens immediately in the post slavery era, the, the, the period of gradual, um, when, when slavery sort of goes away gradually is, is essentially imposed segregation, um, enforced poverty, uh, lack of any kind of uh, recognition as, as citizens. Um, I, I do try to cover this in the end of, uh, of Black Walden, but again, I, I will put in the chat the, the, this, this uh, biography of Phyllis Wheatley because it, it does so well talk about, at least in Boston, um, what happened to her. And it's, it's very illustrative of what other people, certainly we know in Concord and, and most likely in Lincoln as well, what they, what they dealt with. Um, when they were not protected by the people who had enslaved them. Yeah. I'll, I'll put it into the chat, I'll look for it. That was part of the reason why I thought the story of Viola Thayer was so enraging that uh, John Hartwell, who hardly needed the last $82 of Viola Thayer's estate, nevertheless took it rather than, apparent, rather than passing it along to Violet's mother. I mean, uh, the, it really is sort of part, even the way in which the, the Oliver children were handled and the town's interest was not in helping the poor and particularly poor blacks thrive. Uh, its principal interest was just simply what's the cheapest we can get by with here. There, there were a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, the name of the book that would make people mad again, and someone thought it was dis two people thought it was disowning slavery. That's correct. Yeah. And what's the author's name again? Uh, last name is Malish. M E L I S H. Thank you. Malish. Okay. I, I'm at the risk of. Uh, inserting myself too much. I, I'm so struck in the history of uh, the institution of slavery, even, you know, in, and especially in this area where there weren't great plantations of slaves, uh, where slaves, enslaved people lived uh, one by one, sometimes in private houses and so on, where presumably they were fed, presumably uh, they were not cold, presumably they had clothing so they wouldn't disgrace their owners. But the, what I find so deeply troubling is the policy, the strategy, the mindset that uh, handling the African, the population of African descent, uh, controlling it meant interrupting family structure, interrupting African American family structures, uh, interfering at all cost with uh, the creation of bonds of family and everything else that goes along with that, uh, community, education, uh, accumulation of property, any kind of sense of solidarity. And unfortunately, uh, of course, the policies that we have seen in recent years in this country are not directed only to people of African descent, but this strategy of disrupting family life, of disrupting the bonds of family is, is such a cruel and disastrous weapon. Uh, and uh, instrument of subjugation. And unfortunately, we have not left this policy and this strategy behind us. Uh, I find it deeply, deeply troubling to see our 
our own country now in the mirror of these practices. And I would even go farther to say that, uh, for example, the fact that it's extremely difficult for people of modest means to live in our area, this has a disruptive effect on family structures as well, because people are working at a great remove from where they live. Uh, their time with their families is decreased and so on. I just, uh, uh, we think of this as a, a distant mirror for the 18th century, but it's really entirely too much like us. And I, I like your question, Don, about what, what are people going to think of us mm. in a couple hundred years? Could yeah. we sit by and let certain things persist? Mm -hmm. I'd also add, Mary, that I, it's often remarked that one has to be careful not to impose our own sensibilities and values back into mm -hmm. history. I don't find that persuasive in this particular case because the arguments against mm -hmm. slavery were vigorous and well articulated mm -hmm. uh, as early as uh, Samuel Sewell's The Selling of Joseph in 1701. Mm -hmm. uh, John Adams refused to, to to uh, accept the labor of any person who was enslaved. He wouldn't borrow slaves from his neighbors or hire them. Um, Abigail Adams is very vigorous also about how much she hates slavery. So we're not, we're not transporting modern ideas and taking them back there. We're asking a different question and that is why the hell didn't you listen back then? Mm -hmm. So, so I, I was very interested in, in re hearing you talk about when the pews were reallocated with wealth. And I remember reading in Charlie Styron's book, and I think it was 1848, which is not your, your century, but that, 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 I, that the first parish joined with all of the, or many of the other uh, uh, congregational churches, if that's what they were called. Uh, to not allow anyone to take communion who owned or trafficked in slavery. So there was a, a slow emergence for that. But I don't know whether it, this, this thing that they voted at, at one of the church meetings was kept. I mean, did, did this happen? If the most prominent people owned slaves, did you not allow them to take communion? I just don't know. Yeah. But at least the sentiment was beginning. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think we have, would have time for one more question. And then I'm going to call in Sarah Mattis and then the Reverend Jenny Rankin to close this session um, or to perhaps close is the wrong word, to uh, add their thoughts um, to this session um, about where we go from here. So does, any, does anyone want to ask a, a final question before we do that? I don't see a hand, so I'm going to go to Sarah Mattis. Um, well, thank you all for hosting this and thank you to Don. I think that the, the, um, the First Parish's uh, Racial Justice Journey is an amazing program. And if uh, anybody here is not on the mailing list, I would encourage you to get on it and, uh, and see the, the breadth of the programs that are being offered and the um, deep dive it will allow you to understand this part of our history. Um, what this brings home to me is just reinforcing the importance of understanding history and digging deep into it, even if it's uncomfortable, unpleasant and ugly. Perhaps it's more important to us to dig that, to make that deep dive. Um, and in this case, it's giving voices and giving faces and names to people who otherwise did not have them. And it's recognizing them. And that, that in and its, uh, of itself to me is an important act. It's also to me important for us to understand that you know this town that we love that it's a great privilege for us to be living in this town 
that was built on the backs, as Tom mentioned, uh, I think quite well pointed out that it was built on, you know, on the backs of other people, enslaved people who did, were not, they did not get to share the benefits. And, um, you know, and their descendants perhaps are not able to share the benefits today. So to me personally, the challenge is taking this history, continuing to dig, dig deep, continuing on with it. Um, the historical society is committed to doing more of this work. I know Elise is going to be working with us and, with, and we will be uh, working also with the racial justice journey going forward. Um, but to me, the challenge is how do we then take this and appreciate this privilege that we have as white people living in this town? How do we personally um, explore what, uh, and not just not do self-flagellation, but how do we understand how to move forward with this information and look at our own lives to understand how we might make a contribution for, dare I use the words reparations, but make amends um, personally with our own personal wealth, with our own personal connections, with the organizations that we are involved with, with the community in which we live, with our friends and neighbors. How do we translate that into action going forward? And that is, to me, a great challenge. And I certainly have no answers. I know what I'm personally trying to do. And I know what the organizations I'm working with are trying to do. And Don has done an incredible job tonight of um, providing us with much uh, to contemplate, think about. Um, but the challenge is, you know, best, the path going forward and in all the of our lives. Thank you. Thank you to the host tonight. And thank you again to Don. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you uh, for um, your generous co-sponsorship um, of this event. It's very important to us, I think, at First Parish. And now I want to recognize our wonderful interim minister, Jenny Rankin. Thanks, Mary. Thanks everyone. It's wonderful to see you all tonight. Dawn, it's good to see you at least on Zoom and Elise, and I've enjoyed both of your, your work so much. Um, I guess um, I, I do also want to thank the organizers, the Racial Justice Journey. I've, um, I've learned an awful lot um, being in this parish and um, appreciate their leadership so much. And I know there are a lot of conversations going on around town, not just at First Parish, of course, but in many different venues. I think um, maybe I'll just end with a couple of the questions that I um, said were on my mind last Sunday. Um, like many of you, I'm eager for the I don't know if it's going to be Dawn or someone else to go to the next chapter of the 19th century, but um, um, I'm aware that um, in Concord, the Anti-Slavery Society was founded in a parishioner's home, Mary Merrick Brooks in 1837. So I'm wondering if there was an anti-slavery society in Lincoln or if people from Lincoln traveled to Boston or Concord or other towns to participate. Um, and I'm curious about what was preached at the First Parish in Lincoln pulpit during the 1840s and 50s, um, just as I was curious about what was preached in the Concord pulpit when I was a minister there. Um, and to uh, uh, Tom Hazlitt's question about finance, it, I'm thinking it's not just the finances in the 18th century, but in the 19th century, um, as families were connect, continued to be connected to the slave trade, as we learned on our trip to Bristol, Rhode Island and the DeWolf family. You know, I'm sure some of that money did end up funding some of the Lincoln institutions, including probably the first parish in Lincoln. So I think there's a financial trail to follow that probably goes well into the 19th century. So that's gonna take a lot of um, digging and research. And so we may not need to find a young, great intern to help us with that. But those are some of the things, as I think about the church's connection to slavery, um, uh, now that we've learned more about the 18th century, I'm, I'm eager to 
to hear the next chapter. So really just thank you to all of you. I agree with Sarah that um, the next part of the journey is important. I was very intrigued with Elise's comments about uh, visible, uh, making history visible at her, her Bemis lecture. I thought that was extremely interesting. And I, I think probably, I hope, I guess, that we'll be talking more about that at First Parish in Lincoln. Now that we know more about our own history as a church, is there a way we want to make that more physical, visible physically as people walk onto the church grounds? And that's a question clearly not for me, but for the church to discuss. So that's what I've got. And just thank you so much. And I look forward to what's next week. Every Thursday we're here. What's, what's happening next week? Just remind me. So next week. Uh, we are streaming a PBS documentary that was aired. Um, it was re-aired recently in the spring from the American Experience series uh, uh, called The Pilgrims. And it's about the prehistory of the 1620 voyage, uh, about the theological underpinnings of uh, the pilgrims' um, transatlantic quest for uh, a space of freedom to worship, uh, about their difficulties in, in the first um, years of their time in this area, uh, and about their understanding of their relationship with indigenous inhabitants of this region. We are shifting in, for the month of November to uh, a focus on the interrelated lives, entangled lives, again, of indigenous peoples and peoples of European descent uh, in this area. And then we will be returning uh, to issues uh, involving um, uh, African-American um, residents uh, of not only of our area, but of the nation in, uh, in December. So in November, we'll have this, we're streaming this, we'll be streaming a wonderful talk by Jill Lepore about King Philip's War. And then we'll be streaming another uh, segment of the PBS series, We Shall Remain, about indigenous peoples. So we'll have uh, a number of um, streamed um, video uh, showings and, and the talk by um, Jill Lepore to feed our minds. So we hope and you- And then in December, oh, go, excuse me, Mary. Go ahead, go ahead, Joan. In December, we'll be looking at, at uh, reconstruction and uh, I hope we will be able to look at what some of the scholar, some of the scholars are calling the third reconstruction and that will bring us up to today. And then we go to our second module in the winter, and that will be the issues uh, module that's headed by Barbara Slater. And then we will have an action um, issues that I think that learning this history, you know, James Baldwin, I'm paraphrasing him terribly, but said, you know, we are our history. And if we don't face it, we will not move forward. And I think that this is so important. And I find that I'm learning so much. I just feel so grateful. Thank you for speaking for all of us. And this is really quite a constellation of historical luminaries with Don Hafner, Elise Lemire, Ray Shepard. Uh, we are so uh, grateful to have you all uh, and to have Don's lecture and to have this wonderful conversation with so many participants. Thank you everyone for being here. Thanks to Ben Wells, our technical guru, without whom none of this could happen. Thank you so much. And we look forward and do uh, send Joan, uh, um, Joan Kimball your name if you are not on the list to receive the racial justice newsletter. Joan is the editor of that newsletter and she is a champ. Uh, at getting all kinds of information. If you have missed previous events and want to, or want to watch again, for example, last week's talk with Ray uh, or uh, some of the other events, um, there are links. So we invite you 
uh, to keep with us. Thanks so much.